So what I'm going to do is uh, invite up to the stage our panel members, and our theme is around creating value of real-time business. And these gentlemen are at the forefront of the leadership within their companies that really take a look at what they're doing around their business and how they set direction within the company that really affects the industry as a whole. And so I'd like to start with uh, Chuck Furlow, the CEO of Aquarian Water. Chuck. Thank you. Chuck, if you would, maybe just give uh, just some brief highlights on Aquarian Water. Uh, we're a regulated utility uh, based in Connecticut. We serve three states. Uh, water, public water supply is uh, the product. And we serve Connecticut and Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Opened our doors in 1857, so we've been keeping the pipes wet for a long time. Great. We uh, implemented SAP in uh, 2007. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to be here. OK. And uh, so our next guest, Moray Dewhurst, who is the CFO of NextEra Energy. So, Maury, if you would, just a, a few words about NextEra. Sure. Uh, NextEra is one of the largest uh, U.S. or North American power companies. Uh, we have two principal businesses, Florida Power and Light, a traditional, fully rate-regulated, vertically integrated utility in whose service territory you now are. And for anyone who is not from South Florida, welcome. Uh, our other business, Next Era Energy Resources, is the largest producer of, of electricity from wind and solar in North America. Great. Thanks so much. And our next panelist, Gary Hayes, who's the division vice president and CIO of Centerpoint Energy. So Gary, if you would, just a few words on, uh, on Centerpoint. Well, Centerpoint Energy is a regulated utility with uh, some competitive ser energy services. Uh, we serve about 5.5 million customers across, meter customer across six states. Uh, primarily our electric business in Houston, uh, we've deployed about 2.5 three million smart meters, and the remaining customers are our gas customers. Great, thank you. And last but not least, Dave Harkinson, Harkness, sorry, uh, from uh, XL Energy, the Vice President and CIO. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> Dave, if you would, just a few words on XL. Sure, we're a vertically integrated gas and electric uh, utility. We service eight states, uh, 3.5 million electric customers and another 1.9 million of gas. Uh, we're the number one uh, wind provider for 10 years running. Um, and we've got about $10 billion in, in revenue annually. Great. Well, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. So what I thought I would do is just start off with a, a general question. and. Uh, and just go around the, the, the panel and let you uh, provide uh, an answer. So many utilities have seen a change in their business models due to many factors. What do you see as the biggest factor affecting the industry today? And then as a second part, how does this factor affect the long-term planning and decisions made at the senior executives and at the board levels within your company? Chuck, you want to start us off? Um, I think three biggest uh, uh, pillars are, would relate to the, uh, the customer, the shareholder, and the regulator. And I think the biggest change is coming on the customer side. I think that personal opinion, I think utilities have uh, done a mediocre job only in terms of service delivery in years gone by. And we have an opportunity, I believe, with technology to wow the customer base uh, that has really never been accomplished before. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, longer term planning, there are massive amounts of investment needed in the utility sector, certainly in water and gas, uh, water and electricity to be sure. Um, and that extracting efficiency from that investment, capital investment, is going to be key 
in terms of customer affordability. Thank you. Maury? Well, I'm very struck by some of Stephen's comments because I think the, uh, the biggest single issue facing our industry really is uncertainty. Uh, uncertainty in a number of dimensions in particular, uh, uncertainty about technology, uncertainty uh, about policy. Uh, and I'm struck because we all have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty, which in a sense requires some attempt at prediction, um, but prediction is hard. Uh, and in fact, uh, in our industry, I think uh, there's a good record of companies who have not done well by placing big bets on preferred directions. Uh, and so I think one of the implications is that you have to try a lot of things, you have to experiment, and you have to uh, do your experimentation on a small scale initially, but be prepared to scale up very rapidly as you figure out which things work, whether it's in terms of customer acceptance or technologies that, that do or don't work. So I think the, the impact of uncertainty and the impossibility really of predicting things absolutely drives a great deal in how you need to approach the business. Well, I think, Henry, it's real warming to know that we have the accuracy of a monkey on a dartboard <laughs> yeah. when we talk about this. So, you know, I look at a lot of things that are happening, and I would talk about convergence and the speed of that convergence, the consumer technologies, uh, informational technologies, business technologies, and operational technologies. All of those things are coming together as we focus on the future. You know, he ta uh, the author talked about you know, technology being a significant driver of change and uh, the customer that I, I got it, I like it, I want more. So those are the things that I think that are really starting to shape how our industry is going to change in the future. Dave? You know, one of the things that I would talk about is the uh, amount of investment that's required by our industry um, and, and uh, the lack of an appetite for increased rates. Um, we've got a real uh, distaste for rate cases um, and increasing rates for our, uh, for our end customers. You know, a lot of that investment is coming from the aging infrastructure that we have, um, significant renewable investments that are mm -hmm. required. Um, Fukushima drove significant investments into the nuclear uh, area. And then I think to go along with what Charles was saying around the customer, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're competing with uh, obviously lots of other folks for investors. Um, and then on the customer front, uh, as far as that customer interface goes, we compete with every industry uh, as far as that customer interaction. Um, so there's significant investments that are required there as well. Great. So I'm, I'm hearing customer uh, forecasting, prediction, being able to look at uh, bringing all that data together from the convergence, the IT, OT, CT, BT, mm -hmm. as Gary uh, pointed out. And then how do you deal with some of the uh, investments into that infrastructure, especially with um, geopolitical and uh, geo events like Fukushima uh, really changing the landscape in, in some of the areas. So, so Dave, I'm gonna stay with you. So um, during a recent utility conference, there were discussions around smart energy solutions to ensure reliable, affordable, and increasing cleaner energy, gas, and water for America. What types of technology for improving reliability um, of supply and delivery service are you seeing to address ways to provide smarter solutions? Um, you know, I'd probably, uh, probably talk about three things there. Um, the first is I think there's a lot of real-time uh, capabilities uh, that are out there. Uh, a lot of the uh, convergence of the devices that Gary talked about uh, allow for automation in recovery. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to roll a truck uh, to, to get certain things, uh, you know, different capabilities uh, restored. A lot of the, that's automated. Um, and then I'd probably jump in as a number two is a lot of the more uh, predictive where analytics has really come in. Uh, to help in that regard. We do quite a bit of work around in our gas area um, with predictive and prioritization of investment uh, where analytics helps us. And we're also trying to move forward with asset analytics, um, again, to really help uh, better understand which, which, which equipment devices uh, need to be swapped out prior to failure instead of waiting until they do fail which improves reliability. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third piece that I'd probably talk about is from a workforce perspective. You know, all of us are facing uh, an aging workforce. 
Um, we've got a significant workforce transition on our hands. Um, and I think process standardization, uh, process automation, uh, standardizing the tools uh, that folks use to do their jobs, I think is, is also key to, 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 to mm -hmm. being able to improve that reliability and performance. So Chuck, from a, a water uh, utilities perspective, what, uh, what would be your thoughts around I would smart agree, solution? I would agree with David. I, I, I would add uh, focus on um, energy conservation, um, energy efficiency, um, sustainability, and environmental, and all of that against the backdrop of finding innovative ways for customer engagement through um, e-billing and e-payment and um, um, social media. Mm -hmm. which uh, adds a significant level of complexity as well. So, Maury, with um, kind of the, uh, the consumer, and Steve talked about, you know, some of the studies they've done, which I thought was very interesting. You know, they claim, people claim to be environmentalist, the moral part, but then when they get down to it, it's really kind of following the, the herd. Um, and, and so, do you think that the consumer will finally become part of the smart energy solution? And if so, what way? And then, could an Amazon-like service model, which seems to get a lot of attention, help utilities achieve a smart solution? Well, again, I was very struck by some of Stephen's comments because we certainly see a, a big uh, gap between what consumers profess uh, in areas of relevance to our service and the way they generally seem to behave. Uh, it is certainly true that you can uh, influence customer behavior through economic means, but in general, uh, my observation has been that you have to send them price signals that are so extreme that we're actually much better off as an industry doing something pretty obvious, which is meeting our customer needs through an economic supply solution. Uh, second comment would be that, um, in general, we don't want our customers to have too much contact, in fact, any contact with our primary service. Uh, and if you talk to customers, they don't really want to have much to do with our service either. They want to come home, flip the switch, have the lights go on, the air conditioning operating, uh, they care about billing. Um, and regretfully for us, they actually don't really want that much to do with us. And when they do want uh, to do something with us, they want it to be handled quickly and efficiently. Uh, so all that leads you in the direction that Chuck just mentioned, which is changing the way that you interact with uh, customers, taking advantage of uh, modern technology to enable customers to interact with you the way they want to interact, not the way your system is designed to. So much greater emphasis on self-service. So in that respect, I, see, I think there are some, there's some relevance from the Amazon model, but uh, in other respects, I think that's actually a poor analog for our industry. Mm -hmm. So uh, Gary, the same uh, uh, question to you as well. From a customer perspective, you're doing a lot around some uh, customer analytics and, and programs to, in your call centers. What are your thoughts? about that as well. Well, you know, I think the one thing is, uh, and I, I go to the point that the author was making relative to data and information is those, I would probably add a third, there's those that believe they use it and those that think they use it and there's those who wish they used it. Mm -hmm. And I think we're probably in this industry as much a how do we really use information uh, that we can leverage in a way to better serve our customers and we're just on the kind of early stages of that, that game compared to the Amazons and the Ebays and all of those groups that, that Netflix that study those uh, mm -hmm. areas. But I think some of the things that are interesting of how that's come together in Texas and the competitive footprints manifested some of that. It, uh, some of our retail providers who are now taking the 15 minute interval data and offering free nights and weekends. Uh, mm -hmm. Also, a flat rate regardless of your consumption. So, a variety of different ways. I mean, it's hard to package electrons, you know, or, or therms differently. You know, we're in, we're in the business in a way that, you know, we're very susceptible because if there are alternate ways to produce that and produce it locally in my home or however that may occur in the future, it's, it's energy. Mm -hmm. So, it's the services around that, the things that I can bring to the table 
that are the differentiators. So we've tried to look at that from both the operational dimension, from the customer dimension as we serve our customers and be more predictive, be more personalized in that space, but then also providing information outwardly to the market and the market being able to absorb that and then actually reinforcing uh, the benefits of analytics and the capabilities of what it can bring tied to our industry. Hmm. The Amazon model, though, is incredible. It's, uh, they've, um, they've, they've created a paradigm where a customer can interact and interface and do a transaction, and if the transaction goes awry because you've ordered the wrong thing, you can return it mm -hmm. and get the right thing back. I, I recently, in the last year, had ordered some uh, telephone hardware equipment through Amazon. Mm -hmm. I ordered the wrong stuff, my fault. Um, had the transaction, again, returned and, and, and uh, everything was righted. Um, but even I figured it out, and, uh, which mm -hmm. was quite incredible as well. <laughs> <laughs> so if I can do it, there's hope. And <laughs> yeah, not so how you return electricity or water, but, uh, but the model of being able to really feel like Amazon. Customer friendliness and, on and your side. ease, exactly right. Mm -hmm. Exactly right. In the last year, we, we ramped up uh, e-billing and uh, and the initial onset was a little clunky, and so we spent an inordinate amount of time with customers online and gummed up the works in the call center as a result of it. Mm. But so if, if you can take Amazon as a model for simplicity, um, it's, mm. it's, it's quite remarkable. Yeah. Well, probably another example, we, we've started deploying our, our power alert services you know, with the smart meters, the capability to understand an outage. And it's remarkable the feedback from the customers. And one in particular said, you know, it's fantastic you let me know mm -hmm. because all I, and, and then we're going to be back on in four hours. He said, I took the beer out of the refrigerator so it wouldn't go bad. And I just waited. <laughs> so, you know, it's, the, it's, it's an interesting kind of interaction now with the consumer that they understand we know that we're trying to be proactive, that we're, we're trying to work with them you know, perhaps when their power goes out. Right, right. Yeah, let me just add one uh, element to this, which maybe goes slightly against this. I think anything you do with the consumer in our industry has to be simple. Uh, so there's plenty of evidence now uh, about consumer behavior with respect to energy saving devices or devices with the potential to assist in saving energy within the home. And very typically, there is an early on gee whiz factor, playing around with it, you know, early adoption, and then it rapidly tails off. So unless and until you get the offering uh, to be really, really simple, so that ideally it's the app on the phone, and I press one of three buttons, unless you get to that stage, I think cons consumers are not going to be very interested. Consumers have much better things to do with their time than worry about electricity or gas mm -hmm. or water. They want that part of it taken care of as much as possible. Yep. Uh, the, where, where I would add to that is we had, a, uh, in our smart grid city in Boulder, um, you know, we had a requirement to do 2,500 in-home pilots where we were going to go out to the home, uh, help them install the device, walk them through it, train them how to use it. Um, and we, at the end of the day, we couldn't get rid of the 2,500. I mean, you don't, that's not a very big number, right? 2,500. Right. Um, and you go, and so we had all kinds of things. First you do mailers, just let us know who wants to do this. And then you literally go door to door. Um, we ultimately had to go outside of the Boulder footprint uh, in order to do them. Because again, um, you know, the folks are like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to think about it. I want to flip my switch, power goes on. So if we apply Stephen's lesson, David will be giving a few away for free and you'll all think they're really good. <laughs> we got rooms full of them. <laughs> Okay, so, um, so Maury, this is for you. Um, with the investment coming back into the utility sector from people like Warren Buffett, who was at a recent uh, Edison Electric Institute conference, how do you see utilities changing over the next three to five years, given that some of the utility bond valuation has declined in the past few years? Well, first of all, I would just point out that uh, our industry is one of, if not the biggest capital investor in the U.S. economy. For the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've averaged 70 to 80 billion a year in uh, capital deployment. 
Uh, I don't think that's going to change. If anything, the demands are for greater capital investment. Uh, most of what we invest in inherently has a very long life. Uh, and so we are, as I mentioned earlier, forced to make decisions with a great deal of uncertainty because technology uh, is changing very rapidly as it affects our industry. Uh, so I think the, the pressure is to make decisions that, at least the way we think about it, are aligned as best we can see with long-term trends, but flexible and economic in the short term. And just to illustrate that, one of the long-term trends that we have observed seems to uh, be in place and seems likely to continue is a long-term bias for actions that, in some sense, clean up the environment. As mm -hmm. societies get wealthier, people are more willing to devote a portion of their economic well-being to having an attractive environment, however mm -hmm. they choose to define that. So as a result, we have, for a long time, for 20 years, tried to take uh, make our capital deployment decisions always on the right side of that long-term trend, mm -hmm. while at the same time trying to make sure that they are economic in today's environment. So if you can have a, a, a capital investment that makes sense in today's economic environment, but has a slight bias to way that you, the direction that you think the way the world is going, even though you have no idea exactly how the world's going or how fast it's going to get there, mm -hmm. that's a pretty robust way to make decisions. Mm -hmm. So, Chuck, I'll ask you the same question, having investment, heavy assets, um, you know, what, uh, what are your thoughts on the investment strategies? I think bright days ahead. Um, the, uh, what we've seen in the last two to three years of people have st stayed away from uh, the bond market and have gone to utilities instead because it's not as, the bond market is, is, is risky mm -hmm. um, and utilities are not. And so we've seen a migration in, in stockholder uh, um, interest uh, toward the utility sector. And I think that will continue. And the other factor I think that has uh, come into play in the last decade is uh, the emergence of private equity into the utility world. Mm -hmm. uh, my parent company is Macquarie Utilities. Um, and they have in the US alone four regulated utilities, uh, Puget, uh, electric and gas, Duquesne Power and Light, Hawaii Gas, and Aquarion. And that model brings in retirement uh, uh, pension funds um, in the investment of uh, the utility sector. Mm -hmm. And retirement funds have um, all kinds of money with nowhere to go. And so the, the private equity emergence in the utility world has opened the doors for that as, as well. So, I think it's good days ahead for the utility world. Hmm. Any comments from Well, Gary I think, too, and it, it goes to the point on the capital investments. You know, being in the industry for a long time, there was a lot of predictability, you know, low growth or uh, the activities you had forward, so you would go into long-term planning. Now that long term is not so long, mm -hmm. so the speed in which change is coming at us almost puts us in a preparatory mo mode we have to anticipate to be there, you know, be there where the puck's going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So that's not how our regulatory models are constructed in that format. So how do we actually think about investment profiles that position us as these changes occur in a way that we can not only ensure sustainability, but recoverability? And I think that's a tremendous challenge that we're facing today. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. And with the increased focus, by the investment community, the Warren Buffetts of the world. Um, with that increased attention comes increased focus. Mm -hmm. Focus for efficiency and delivery and shareholder growth. And I think the, the things that uh, Gary is just talking about are, are really particularly important when it comes to investments in information technology and grid automation. Those are areas where it's very easy to be second-guessed by your mm -hmm. regulator. One of the things that, as we embarked on our smart grid initiative some years ago, we made a conscious decision to do was to justify the economics of everything we did strictly on the internal side, the operational side, and mm -hmm. viewing anything external customer-facing 
as upside. We didn't mm. let the teams count it in their economics. And the thought was that if we can justify it on its own, own merits for things it will do for our side of the fence, then that puts us in a good position with our regulator and it makes us much better, much better positioned to accept any upside that there is on the customer mm. side and treat that as just a, mm. a bonus. That's an excellent point because any investment you want to have covered, you don't want to have rejected right. in your regulatory expense model. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Mm. Or you'll have an unhappy shareholder. Mm. <laughs> so um, Gary, for you, um, with uh, distributed generation, low cost, abundant natural gas, and the movement toward renewable energy that uh, several of the uh, panelists have invested quite a bit it's uh, not only coming from Main Street, the environmental uh, aspects, but also Wall Street now is getting a, uh, a lot of attention. Um, so how important are analytics and real-time decision-making um, to the senior executives at, at utilities now with these different dynamics going on? Well, I think it goes back to what we were talking about, about the investments and being able to look down the road in a ways to understand what's coming at us. And distributed generation, we could probably sit the rest of the day and talk about what that might do. The reality is that something's going to happen, which means I'm going to have to introduce certain kinds of characteristics to my systems that I don't have, perhaps, today, where we have significant amount of control on our transmission systems and our regional transmission authorities. That's moving down to our distribution systems. And we're now in control systems that are integrally dependent, whether it's my distribution system, my telecom system, or my IT systems. And they have to work in harmony to ensure that real-time capabilities. So now as I look at that, that's a mass amount of information that's flowing at us. You know, the, just these numbers are rough, but an average person makes a decision in 700 milliseconds. Very simple. An average switch operates in 500 milliseconds takes 50 milliseconds on good broadband back and forth. I'm out of time to make the call. Mm -hmm. So how do I actually now, in an environment where I might have voltage dropping or certain weather conditions that are promoting instability in what was a very stable system, how am I going to manage that? How do I look at responding to that? So the analytics play a big part. The other dimension is, you know, we. We've reorganized, we've become efficient, you know, all the companies focus in on the things in the past to create our crew efficiencies, our operational efficiencies. How do we squeeze those last bits of capabilities uh, from that? Because the wrench turner is only going to be able to get to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes upon us, the management team, the leadership team, to take information to make better decisions about how to get them there, how to get them safely there, making sure they have the right things they need, and creating the f efficiencies from information and the management of that information as opposed to saying, can you work faster? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I spent yes. uh, four years in England, and I thought that the English were masters at capital efficiency, that if you, um, I would say that if you gave a Brit uh, 100 pounds to build a widget, they'd come back with the widget built for 68 pounds, mm -hmm. and that was 32 pounds to throw back into the program or go grow the company with. Or, and and that, that capital efficiency is going to be key for the future, and that's where getting good information is essential. Mm -hmm. um, because if you have a billion dollars requirement for capital investment over a set period of time, and you can extract efficiency of 10%, that's 100 million bucks you got to throw back into your program. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of focus that I think we'll be under as we move forward. You know, one of the things that I'd add is that the speed that, that those technologies are coming at us, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got rooftop solar, um, tax incentives and different things uh, are pushing those things out into the, 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 our real world environment uh, much faster than I think our industry can really study and say, what's, what's the most efficient use of that? Is mm -hmm. neighborhood solar uh, a more efficient use? Um, is or, or is rooftop the way to go? You know, what, what, what is the right decision for us? Um, and I think we've got to spend a lot more time um, up front because at the end of the day, uh, the solar model, the rooftop solar model uh, doesn't work uh, mm -hmm. without the grid, right? right? There's no business model there without the grid to back yeah. it up. So to add to that, one of the implications is 
we need much more, at least close to real-time data on the yeah. financial side mm -hmm. as well. And we need our data to be much more segmented. If you're to understand what the impact on the system economics of introducing additional resources in specific ge geographical locations is, you have to have much more detailed financial cost knowledge that, mm -hmm. generally speaking, we have today. Mm. Uh, and since that changes, you need it in a dynamic fashion. Otherwise, you're going to make the wrong resource decisions. You're not going to be able to approach your regulator for appropriate price structures, which will be needed to send the right price signals so that people do locate the distributed resources in the right places. So it's not just, and I agree with everything that, that Gary said on the what we need to know about our system, but we mm -hmm. now need to know the same kind of stuff about the financial layer yeah. above it. So it's getting back to the speed of business needs to operate at the speed of the operational technologies that are happening out into the grid to make sure that you've got the information at the right time to make that decision. Yeah, and I tie back into that is the, the capability. We all have people going out and staying, working to stay within their budgets so we can hit plan, all of those things. But the capabilities like Walmart or others that they're making shifts daily in stores so they know how goods are being sold and customers are reacting to that. And our capability around dynamic for, forecasting, looking at that forward 36 hours that he was talking about for the next month, and do I actually approve that uh, requisition in SAP for that expenditure? Mm. Because I might make a different decision if I think the next series of months might be a much lower weather forecast, and that's the primary driver of our business. Yeah. Okay, well, the, uh, the final question I have uh, for all of you uh, the last 10 years has seen technology changes at a pace that we've never experienced. Smart grid, we talked about distributed generation, two-way flow of power, information, and a more engaged and informed customer that's emerging. Where does the IT industry in a company such as SAP need to make investments to support these emerging utility models and enable growth for your companies? Dave, I, you want to start? I guess I'll start. Um, you know, one of the, I guess you know I, one of the things I was kind of thinking is you know they always ask the, you know what keeps you up at night and, and yes. I think you know along those same lines, um, one of the things we haven't mentioned is cybersecurity. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's that's clearly a concern that you know when we say where was it three years ago, where was it five years ago, where is it going to be, um, that that just it, that's really scary. So I think as far as uh, the investments by our key partners, SAP. Mm -hmm. Um, that's an area that I think we just we, we have to always be attuned to. Um, the other piece that I'd add to that is is cloud. Um, you know, I, I really imagine a, a scenario where we don't own a data center uh, in you know by the time I retire, mm -hmm. and that's not very far away, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, don't think you got like ten years or something. <laughs> Um, but but I, I think the, the you know from a cloud perspective, um, and you look at the evolution of you know again you don't have to go back very far um, to see how far it's advanced and you know where it can be uh, in the future. I, I think that's a that's a uh, huge piece for us going forward. Gary, I would look at you know SAP is at a core of a lot of the, our our businesses, and if you look at the core components that will be surrounding us in the future in terms of our our transactional systems, our operational systems, you're, gonna, you're a key part of that. You're a big player in the global footprint of those activities. So we talked about speed and the change and the pace of real time and the ability to manage those. I think we have, you have the capability, uh, along with us working with you, to bring the parties together that help us address what that future is going to be. You know, we can't have bolt-ons anymore. We have to have an ecosystem of this stuff flowing across so that our users are, are making the right decisions or the right decisions are making for them. So we need that kind of assistance on the global footprint of bringing all of the players that are around this space. And I think SAP plays an important role in that. So I come at it from the uh, CFO perspective rather than the CIO perspective. And to me, it's fairly simple. It's cheaper, faster, more flexible. Uh, and let me just spend a, the first two, I think, are, are pretty obvious. But um, you know, systems initiatives are massive undertakings, and they inevitably get expensive. We've got to find ways to make them 
uh, cheaper and easier. Uh, but the, I think perhaps the most important one is the third one, flexibility, because the reality is with technology changing, uh, there are going to be hundreds if not thousands of small startup companies with neat technologies that we're going to want to take advantage of. If we don't, our users are going to do it by themselves anyway. Uh, and so uh, large organizations like SAP need to find ways to help us preserve the the scalability, the stability, the security of the large-scale infrastructure, but allow us to attach different things to it, some of which will, we will build on, some of which will turn out to be failures, and to do so in a very quick, flexible fashion. Great. Jeff? I refuse to answer on the grounds that it's going to ruin my presentation of tomorrow morning. <laughs> <laughs> and as a reward for waiting, I'm going to give out free pens, they're worth, seven. <laughs> <laughs> they're worth 17 cents, but I'm told you don't give a damn about the value. <laughs> I think it was Lincoln that once said, should I, uh, should I remain quiet and appear ignorant or speak up and remove all doubts? So uh, <laughs> in deference to uh, Stephen, the prior speaker, uh, I don't have a clue on what the future is bringing. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I thank all of you uh, for your time uh, you. this morning. Um, I think it was a very enjoyable conversation for me. I certainly always learn listening to customers. I hope the audience uh, also found it interesting uh, with the insights uh, that you share with your companies. And uh, again, if you would, please give a round of applause to our panel members this morning. Thank you. Thank you.